Uh, let me start recording. Uh, so today our topic is uh, human nutrition. This topic of human nutrition carries a tremendous amount of marks in your biology final exam because they can bring a diagram of the alimentary canal and you have to sort of label. So you have to identify things known as anatomy, the structure. So you have to identify the structure from the diagram, you label a bit, and then they want you to understand um, the end products of the digestive system. You know, we have three classes of nutrients, uh, carbohydrates, proteins, and uh, uh, fats or lipids. And the examiner wants you to understand uh, how to describe protein digestion in man, lipid digestion in man, or their favorite is usually carbohydrate digestion in man from where it starts up until it ends. So you have to be able to know how to construct an essay and what are the end products and uh, at which point in the digestive system are these end products uh, produced. So that's what we're going to focus on today in terms of human nutrition. So a definition of nutrition, If I before I just start, uh, this isn't in the notes, but it's very important for you to know. Uh, nutrition can be defined as the way living organisms um, obtain and utilize food. So we have got uh, different types of nutrition. If I can get my high highlighter, we have got, um, this takes a, a while. This is just for your understanding, or maybe this might come in an MCQ. So I did define nutrition as the way living organisms obtain and utilize our food. So how do they obtain food? What is their source of food? How do they use it within their body? So all living organisms. And nutrition can be of three types. We can have um, autotrophic nutrition, autotrophic nutrition, you know, auto means uh, self. So autotrophic nutrition will be the type of nutrition where these organisms are producing food on their own from uh, very simple inorganic molecules and plants carry out autotrophic nutrition, you know, for the process of photosynthesis. And then we have got another type of nutrition known as heterotrophic nutrition. So this is a uh, practiced by mostly um, mammals and all multicellular organisms where they break down large complex molecules into simple more soluble ones in a process known as digestion. And there's another type of nutrition known as saprophytic nutrition. So this type of nutrition is where organisms feed on a dead and decaying matter so anything dead and decaying like you know your your fungal molds your fungal molds if you have some some bread and it goes stale you see those green stuff that's fungal molds or uh, bacteria when you know they are eating uh, the dead decaying bodies and you know putrefaction they are just it's rotting so that's another type of nutrition so autotrophic self photosynthesis heterotrophic nutrition we're talking about uh, the digestive process and saprophytic nutrition where these living organisms are feeding on dead and decaying matter so what we're going to focus on today is the second type the heterotrophic nutrition where you are breaking down large complex uh, substances into simple more soluble ones for their utilization in the um, in cellular respiration, I almost said electron transport chain. I wasn't supposed to, to say that. That's sort of A level. And that process that I've just described is known as catabolism. It's a catabolic process. And there are certain amount of digestive enzymes that we're going to talk about. And all these enzymes are going to end in ASE. So lipase, mal maltase except from a few like renin or trypsin, but most of them are going to end in ASE. So this diagram that you can see here on the board, oh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a whiteboard. On the board or on the screen is known as the GIT 
but at your level i don't know why you like calling it the alimentary canal for some weird reason i don't know but it's uh, it's the alimentary canal or the gastrointestinal tract so git gastrointestinal tract and we start here in the mouth in the uh, in in the buccal cavity where you've got uh, a physical type of the, uh, digestion where you have got saliva and your teeth grinding the food. So they call that um, mechanical digestion. Mechanical digestion. And then you have got your digestion that's assisted via enzymes and that's known as chemical digestion. So there are two types of digestions. Mechanical where you're using your teeth uh, saliva to grind the food to make that food bolus for you to easily swallow then you have got your chemical digestion while you are using your your enzymes so you have to know all these structures you have to know where your tongue is uh, your esophagus uh, when i send the notes this diagram will be extremely clear it's just that i i can't seem to zoom properly in one note for some weird reason uh, your uh, epiglottis, this one prevents you from choking. I'm going to explain more on this. Uh, you have got your esophagus where the food bolus sort of um, glides by, by peristalsis to your stomach. Then you have got your liver, which is a very important uh, organ, but in the digestive system, it produces bowel. Then bowel is stored in this structure here known as the gallbladder. And the gallbladder is, go, is connected to the lower part of uh, the small intestine known as uh, the ileum. Oh, sorry, the duodenum. Yeah, the, the duodenum there. Right here at the duodenum, you've got the pancreas. So the gallbladder is secreting bowel, and your pancreas there is also secreting pancreatic juices that are breaking down certain components that we're going to discuss, then everything goes into your small intestines, uh, your, the ileum mostly, which is the longest portion of the small intestines. Absorption takes place there. Oh, sorry, not the ileum, but the jejunum. Yeah, the jejunum, which is the longest portion of your small intestines. Then the last portion there is your ileum, which connects to your large intestines where uh, a lot of water is reabsorbed. Because you know, uh, water and electrolyte reabsorption takes place in the small intestine because we want to utilize all the nutrients because the waste, the waste product has to be sort of uh, dry. It has to be dry, meaning all the nutrients that you can extract from that uh, food has been e extracted. So all that water has to be extracted and mineral salts in the large intestine and then connecting to the large intestine. So the large intestine, you have got ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, and a sigmoid colon there. Then that waste is stored in the rectum then when you feel like uh, going to the bathroom, it's ejected through the exit point known as the anus. So the rectum actually contains a lot of uh, nerve endings that signal to the brain saying, all right, the rectum is full, dispel the waste. So you have to know the sequence of the alimentary canal. So this is what I was explaining. So the gastrointestinal tracts or the GIT, you have to know all these major organs. So if you take a diagram, maybe from a past paper, you're going to see from the videos that I'll send you, you have to be able to identify all these structures without fail. So all these structures, you have to know them properly. So the, uh, the digestive system has a certain um, stages or certain processes or functions of the digestive system. So the first thing that happens is that we 
ingest the food. So ingestion is the first thing, which is the intake of food into the mouth. And then in the mouth, after you've chewed and formed your food bolus, there will be propulsion using peristalsis motion to your stomach. Then there will be digestion. After digestion, there will be a process of, um, which is the breakdown of food into smaller, um, more soluble, um, simple molecules. Then there's a, the process of absorption, which is now the usage the usage of digested food particles or the uptake of digested, uh, digested food particles to the bloodstream for their utilization. And at least now you know where absorption takes place. I told you in the previous video that, you know, in the small intestines, you have got a process of diffusion, but we're going to talk about that uh, very, very soon, uh, hopefully in this first lecture. So absorption, then uh, upside, uh, after the uh, absorption, you have got elimination of undigested food. It's also called defecation. All right, so we're going to move through stages. We're going to start from the mouth, then we're going to go into the stomach, what's happening with the hydrochloric acid and certain digestive enzymes in the stomach. And then afterwards, we're going to go to the small intestines, uh, no, before the small intestines, we'll talk about the pancreas, liver, and gallbladder. Then we're going to talk about the, each part of the small intestine, you know, duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. Then we'll go to the large intestines and then end this lecture of digestion. So basically what's happening in the mouth is the process known as mastication, which is chewing. So chewing, the technical term is known as mastication. What are you using? You're using uh, three things. You're using your teeth, you're using your tongue, and you're using your saliva. So the, the teeth are there to sort of break down those large pieces of food to increase the surface area for enzymatic activity. So what do I mean by when, I'm, when we say to increase the surface area? Imagine this is an enzyme there with uh, a specific active site there, and this is a huge chunk of meat. It would be very hard for this enzyme to act on uh, this, this chunk of meat. But if you get your teeth and you grind it, there'll be smaller pieces. This, this action is known as to increase the surface area. Another example, when I say increase your surface area, for a process to be more effective. Imagine you've washed a blanket. After you've washed a blanket, how do you uh, hang it? You don't fold it and put it on the line, no. You sort of lengthen it out and then you throw it on the line. That lengthening out increases the surface area for the sun and wind and the humid environment to act on that blanket so that it can dry quickly. So that's what we mean by increasing surface area. It's just uh, an action that's going to make uh, a chemical, a, a process much more easier, much more quickly. That's what we mean by increasing the surface area. So when I say that the, the, the teeth are there to sort of break down these large pieces of food, they are increasing the surface area for enzymes to uh, act on them. So that's what the teeth uh, uh, does in the process of digestion. Uh, what about uh, saliva? So saliva is there to moisten the food so that you can easily swallow that food. So that the food goes down by a propulsion uh, very easily. So we've talked about um, the, uh, we, we said there are three things, right? We said we have got, um, Oh, and the tongue also. So the tongue is practically just there to aid in the formation of the food bolus. Every time you swallow food, it's in the form of this roundish uh, food bolus. And uh, by the way, let me mention this uh, now. Digestion of carbohydrates starts in the mouth. I'm going to say this again. The digestion of carbohydrates begins in the mouth. So let me tell you one very important thing. This 
polysaccharide here, starch. Starch is a polysaccharide. The other name for starch, know this, the other name for starch is amylose. The other name for starch is amylose. Therefore, in the mouth, we have got an enzyme known as salivary amylase. So sub salivary amylase is going to start the breakdown of starch, turning it into from a polysaccharide, from a polysaccharide to a disaccharide, to a disaccharide. So starch is also known as amylose, meaning the enzyme that's going to act on starch in the mouth is known as salivary amylase, ending with ASE. And what is it doing? It's breaking down that amylose, the starch, into a disaccharide known as sucrose. So sucrose is a disaccharide made up of glucose plus galactose. If I teach you, I, I, I honestly wish we had time. I would have taught you so many things. There are things known, there are, there are linkages here known as glycosidic bonds that form via a process known as a condensation reaction that links the that links the sugar chains together. So if two sugar chains are linked together, a disaccharide is going to be formed. And that disaccharide, when we're talking about uh, from starch, a polysaccharide being acted upon by salivary amylase, the sugar that will be formed will be a disaccharide, which is sucrose, made up of two units, glucose and galactose. Then at a certain point in the digestive system, there will be an enzyme known as uh, sucrase, pancreatic sucrase, that's going to break down that disaccharide into single monosaccharide units. So that's how you have to start thinking. How do the end products of digestion form at the end of the day? So let's continue. You also have to know, so uh, this is practically the picture of the mouth. But what I'm mostly interested in is the structure of uh, teeth. So I mentioned what the tongue does. Uh, I mentioned this. Uh, so the other name for swallowing is uh, delu uh, delutition. So just say swallowing. No one is going to penalize you. So let's take a look at teeth. So I did mention that what do teeth do? They increase the surface area for efficient uh, action of those enzymes and we have to know what these types of teeth do so these there are four types of teeth interesting stuff you have got your front teeth you know your incisors your canines your premolars your molars and all of these have a specific function that you have to know you have to know the function of uh, your dentition, your types of teeth, uh, like what do they do? Is this one for tearing? Is this one for grinding? Uh, those things are going to uh, be explained in terms of the specific function. But not only that, you also have to know the structure of the basic structure, at least, of a tooth. Like, you know, what's the inner male? What's the dentine? What's the pulp cavity? So you have to know uh, that type of information because they might bring a diagram. So this is a, this is a diagram representing how your teeth look like. All this will be clear. So you start off with uh, your pair of two incisors, then uh, your canines, then your premolars, as well as your molars. And then in the later ages of life, you can develop wisdom teeth. So this is extremely important. At least in total, you have 32 teeth, but the functions of the teeth, please, you have to know this information here, that you have got two incisors and you know they are for cutting. So every time you, if you have a good dentist, because you know the majority of us, we have a lot of cavities 
you know, dental care is very expensive. So you, you might not use the function of your teeth ultimately, you know, you improvise if you have cavities, but in a normal, in a normal non-cavity situation, this is what happens. Your incisors are meant for cutting. So you're going to get your incisors and you will be, uh, they, they are used for cutting. Your canines, you know, those sharp teeth, they are used for tearing. And then now you will start the crushing and grinding process. So your premolars are going to crush the food. Then the fine grinding, the fine grinding, you know, chigayo, will be your last uh, molars. So you cut, you tear, you crush, and then you grind in a normal, healthy, no cavity, at least maybe with some feelings, no more teeth. But we do improvise when we have, um, you know, when we have cavities. This is life. Dental care is not cheap. All right, so you have to know this diagram. You have to, uh, let me highlight the things that you have to know. You have to know that uh, this inner male here is very calcified. It's very calcified. It's practically as strong as bone. Strong as bone, if not stronger. So it's the hard part. It's the it's the it's what you see. That white stuff, that strong thing. It's calcified. It uh, it actually has a uh, calcium and phosphate and uh, phosphate crystals. Very strong. So the inner male is made up of uh, calci. It, it's calcified. It, it's made up of calcified calcium and phosphate crystals. You have, you have to know that. Then you have uh, your gum, which sort of forms the base of uh, your inner male. Then another thing that you have to know, very important, is this part here, your pulp cavity. So your pulp cavity is enriched with blood vessels. Your pulp cavity is enriched with blood vessels, blood vessels and nerves. So every time you start seeing um, whether your, your gums have started bleeding, it's because that tooth decay is actually starting to reach through the pulp cavity. And once you start feeling pain, just know that that cavity is now very deep into the pulp cavity. It's actually now affecting the blood vessels and your uh, nerves. You know, nerve cells send electrical signals to your brain saying, hmm, there's something wrong here. Now you have to visit the dentist. Things are getting bad. So, and, and you have your, your base. So all the teeth, rests, it rests on a uh, what, what do you call this? Your jawbone. Yeah, it rests on your jawbone. Your jawbone. So again, what do I want you to know? You can at least draw this simple structure and you have to be able to tell the examiner that, all right, the inner male is made up of calcified crystals of calcium and phosphate. Then we have got uh, the, the dentine, which forms the, the base. Uh, then we have got your gums there, which sort uh, of what your gums doing. Then you have got your gums there, uh, not that important. But this one also, your pulp cavity contains blood vessels and nerves. That's the region that contains a lot of blood vessels and uh, nerve endings. Are we together? Yes. All right. You, you just have to watch this video, then go through some questions. Once you go through some questions, you'll be like, oh, what, what Mike was saying actually comes in the exam. This is exactly what he was saying. All right, so I've explained this uh, tooth structure. I really want us to, to move. So cutting uh, ETC, uh, this isn't important. I had put it there because I wanted you to know where your saliva comes from. So you have got certain types of uh, salivary glands. You have got your parotid glands there that are located 
adjusts uh, below your ear and your, your submandibular gland and your sublingual gland. So these three glands, they actually produce uh, a lot of saliva and mucus. So at times when someone has like a flu, they, they have a, a, a lot of uh, inflammation, uh, the nose inflames, you know, uh, your tonsil areas inflame, you can't breathe, blame these things, your, your salivary glands, they're the ones that produce a lot of uh, saliva and uh, mucus. All right, so let's now uh, start the whole process of uh, digestion. So away from the mouth, I think we're done with the mouth. Let's now move on to an area known as the epiglottis and your esophagus just when you are about to swallow. Because like I said, the saliva in conjunction with saliva produced by your salivary glands serves to lubricate the food and then the tongue forms that food bolus that, uh, so that you can, uh, so that you are able to swallow that food. So I, I want us to, uh, I already mentioned it contains salivary amylase. So these notes might be a little bit detailed, but uh, use these notes in conjunction with uh, my explanation. Uh, don't mind uh, this structure, it won't come in your exam. This is just your your the back of your throat so your larynx is the back literally the back of your throat when you open your mouth there's that soft part just behind you can see it uh, that's the back of your your throat so don't worry about your larynx all right so your esophagus that's the that's the gullet all right this so this is where where is that diagram uh -huh, yes, here's the diagram I was looking for. So let's say this is the back of your throat. You know, there are two pipes. You have got your windpipe there that connects to your respiratory system and your lungs. And you have another pipe there known as the gullet or the esophagus. So you've got two pipes. There is this structure right here and this structure, you cannot see it. That thing that you see when you open your mouth like that, uh, let's say that's your mouth and uh, the tongue is there. That structure that you see there, it's not the epiglottis things. They call it kagigo. I don't know, you, you, you say kagigo. It's not the epiglottis, it's the uvula. Uvula. It's practically, it just connects the soft palate of your teeth. It's not the epiglottis. The epiglottis, you can't see it because it's at the back, very back of um, the, the pharynx, the back of your throat. So there are two pipes here. When you are swallowing food, you want the food to go into the esophagus. So what this thing does, it's like a lid, the epiglottis. So what it's going to do when you are swallowing, it's going to close this pipe here. So this is your epiglottis. The epiglottis is going to close your windpipe so that you can swallow the food. After you swallow the food, it's going to open again so that you can breathe. So you cannot breathe and swallow at the same time, no. That's a choking hazard. You can only do one thing at a time. So that epiglottis is going to close uh, the opening of your airway so that you can swallow then after you can swallow it releases so that respiration can take place uh, again and the walls of the esophagus are made up of these types of muscles you have got uh, longitudinal and uh, circular muscles maybe let me draw oh no this is fine you have got longitudinal and uh, circular muscles. So these, they contract and relax. So if the food bolus is there, it contracts. Once it relaxes, it will be pushed to this uh, region, to the next region. It contracts. Once it relaxes, it will be pushed to the next region there. So in a wave-like motion, contraction and relaxation, the food bolus is going to be propelled 
down into the stomach. So this is the wave-like motion that I was saying. So the esophagus or the gullet contains these circular and longitudinal muscles. Here we have got a, we've got a contraction there. Uh, here it's relaxed, it's contracted there again. So contract, relax, contract, relax. The circular and longitudinal muscles contract and relax to propel food into your stomach. And this process is known as peristalsis. It's known as peristalsis, happening because of the circular and longitudinal walls of the esophagus. All right, so now we're in the stomach. And you know, the stomach, that's where a lot, a lot of things happen. What happens in the stomach? We have got a lot of acid. And the acid that's found in the stomach is known as hydrochloric acid secreted by your oxyntic, oxyntic cells. Where there's a lot of acid, you know, some people have ulcers. Ulcers are very bad. So why don't we all have ulcers? Because there are certain cells which secrete, they secrete this thick mucus layer. Uh, they secrete this thick mucus layer. What, what are these cells called? Uh, the, I think they are called chief cells. They are called chief cells. They secrete this thick mucus layer to protect the wall of the stomach from the action of this acid. And this hydrochloric acid has a lot of functions. It has a lot of functions. And you also have certain types of enzymes in the stomach. You have got um, trypsin and renin. So this trypsin and renin, that's where protein digestion starts from. So the digestion of proteins is going to start within the walls of your stomach. So protein digestion, there's an enzyme known as trypsin. And I'm going to explain uh, this properly in detail just about now. So I just wanted you to know that in your stomach, there are three things that are happening. You have got acid, which is literally digesting the, the food. And the acid serves to provide a very rich environment for enzyme activities. Remember, digestion takes place via the action of enzymes. And those enzymes that are acting on, on the food in the stomach require a very acidic environment for them to work at an optimum. So enzymes have an optimum temperature that they work, and they also have an optimum pH in which they work. So these are the two things. And the most important uh, enzyme that we have to talk about is this one, trypsin. Renin is not that important because we are adults. I'll explain why renin is not important in terms of why we are adults and we don't need it as such. All right, so this is what I was talking about. So this is um, a gland secretes things. I just put this diagram for your own understanding. So these are the cells that we are uh, looking for. So these here yeah, are the parietal cells or the auxintic cells. These are the ones that secrete the acid. And then we have got these mucus neck cells, which I called chief cells that secrete the mucus layer. And actually, again, what's happening, uh, this will be talked about when we start looking at uh, micronutrients. We have got um, chief cells. Mm -hmm. Chief cells, oh, all right, okay, if I made 
a slight error, the hormone that's produced or the enzyme that's produced, it's pepsin. Oh, my goodness. Pepsin. Trypsin is actually found in um, the pancreas. Yeah, trypsin is, is a pancreatic enzyme. So pepsin and renin are the two types of enzymes. And these are actually secreted by the chief cells. I, I, like, to, I like to mix up pepsin and trypsin. Don't mix up pepsin and trypsin. Pepsin is found in the stomach, and then trypsin is found in, um, in your pancreatic uh, secretions, your pancreatic juices. Don't mix it up uh, the way I mixed it up. And I'll explain actually why, why it's called pepsin. There's, a, there's an interesting uh, thing why it's called pepsin. All right, uh, where do I explain this? I think let me explain it here. Yeah, let me explain it here. So like I said, the digestion of proteins, so this is what happens with proteins. The uh, proteins start with things known as uh, polypeptides. A polypeptide is a very long, long chain of proteins. That's what a polypeptide is, an extremely long, complicated, folded chain of proteins, a polypeptide. Then we have got something known as peptides. A peptide is a shorter chain of proteins. So it can maybe have uh, 12 units of uh, uh, proteins, so a very short chain of, uh, of, of proteins. Then we have got the last unit known as amino acids. Amino acids, which are single protein chains. So the goal of the digestive system, we're trying to go from a huge chunk of meat, you know, a polypeptide into something that can be easily uh, absorbed by the body and these nutrients are utilized. So what happens is that we start off from this part here. Protein digestion starts off in the stomach. You are going to have chief cells that secrete an enzyme known as pepsin. But notice that this word here, pepsin, this enzyme is inactive. If I was talking about uh, A-level biology or biochemistry, I would call this an apple enzyme. Then when it binds to a cofactor, it's going to be called the hollow enzyme form, but that's not a level biology. But when you see this enzyme here, pepsin, ending with I-N, fibrin, pepsin, fibrin, those are inactive enzymes. So what happens, what activates this enzyme? The hydrochloric acid the rich, rich environment in your, in your stomach, the hydrochloric acid. So the hydrochloric acid is going to act on this enzyme and it to convert it to its active form known as pepsinogen. So ending with a G-E-N, it means now the enzyme is active. What's this pepsinogen doing? Pepsinogen, this word pep, peptides, so it's going to act on polypeptides and convert them to peptides, which are slightly shorter chains of proteins. Have you followed that? Yes. You're all right. Okay, thank you. So digestion of proteins starts in the stomach where in the action of hydrochloric acid, the inactive enzyme pepsin is converted to pepsinogen. Pepsinogen is going to act on polypeptides, the long chain of, uh, of proteins, converting them to shorter chains known as peptides. And then the final blow will be now uh, in the upper part of the small intestine where your pancreas meets your gallbladder in, in your duodenum, where now trypsin is going to come in. So uh, from the pancreatic juices, trypsin is going to now act on these peptides, 
turning them into amino acids. So the uh, protein digestion starts in the stomach and ends uh, in the small intestine, in the upper part of the small intestine. So this is what's happening, very important stuff. So renin, so renin, what renin does, you, you know, when milk is in the stomach, it sort of forms something that's very uh, bound together, co coagulated, very coagulated. You know, milk forms chunks in the stomach. No wonder certain people um, cannot digest milk. They, they have something known as lactose intolerance. So this, there's an enzyme in the pancreas known as lactase that digests uh, certain uh, milk components here. So what renin does in the stomach is that it, com it breaks these same chunks. So these insoluble milk chunks, it's going to break them into more soluble ones. And these soluble ones can be acted upon by the enzyme lactase, where we can now break uh, that milk protein into uh, more simple soluble amino acids. So renin, it's the, the, actually the secretion of renin in adults decreases, it decreases as we get older. So the consequence of age is lactose intolerance, unfortunately, uh, that's, that's the bad part of uh, aging. So the, the, the final thing that I want to say to you, because I'm seeing it's almost 15 hours and I have an appointment at 15, my phone is literally everywhere. The last thing I would want to mention is function of hydrochloric acid. So hydrochloric acid serves to destroy the bacteria that we ingest in, with, with the food. It also serves to activate this inactive uh, enzyme there, the pepsin, converting it to pepsinogen. And it's also there to provide a rich environment for all these other enzyme activities. So next time we're going to meet, we're going to finish, we'll finish this, this topic. It's quite, look, there are like 91 slides. Why 91 slides? Because I also included things like, uh, you know, your micronutrients, your vitamin A, B, C, E, T, E, T, C. You have to know what water-soluble vitamins are. You have to know what fat-soluble vitamins are. So I, I want us to finish this lecture in three sessions. So next time we meet, we're going to, you know, what's happening in the large intestines, small intestines, and we're going to look at the micronutrients and finish this. Let me respond to people before they kill me. Let me end the lecture here, and I'm still working on those videos. They are long. I'll send them. So please, uh, did you receive yesterday's class? Yes. All right, let me send this one immediately also. Please uh, study. July is just over there. We're almost, almost towards the exam. I will see you tomorrow for mathematics, hopefully. See you tomorrow. Let me send the class. Okay.